Uh, so thank you for uh, being here today. My name is Diane Styers. Um, I teach out at Western Carolina University, about an hour west of here. Um, I'm going to take a moment uh, really quickly to kind of talk about um, where I'm from and why I'm here uh, before I get going on this presentation. So um, Western Carolina is the westernmost school in the UNC system and it's a regional comprehensive university. So we have higher than average um, percentages of a low income um, working adults, veterans, first generation students and students of color. Um, for example, we have 37% uh, of our student population are first generation students. And so many of our students work uh, through their um, time in school and are eager to get um, jobs um, after graduation to uh, better their lives. So I'm here to um, for a couple of reasons. One, to see what industry practitioners are um, doing in their work, to see what new skills we can teach to our students so that they're better prepared for the workforce, and to also make connections with industry partners so that when um, jobs do come open, uh, we can send those well-prepared students uh, to you for uh, job placement. So um, today what I'm going to be presenting is an undergraduate student project. Um, I teach in the Natural Resources Conservation and Management Program at Western, and um, it's an undergraduate-only program. We don't have any graduate students. And this is a project from an introduction to remote sensing course that I teach. Um, so the course covers kind of the basic foundations of remote sensing and then about three weeks of LIDAR um, data analysis. And then at the, at the end of the semester, there's about three weeks for a project. So this project was done in about three weeks time um, by a student with um, very little help from me. So uh, he was too shy to come present this himself. So I'm going to present for him. So just kind of an overview of what I'll be presenting is a little bit of a background on Sea Island itself, um, the data that we used, the uh, methods that he used, um, some, I'm gonna call these preliminary results um, because like I said, he did this um, in a class project this past spring um, at the end of April, early May. And uh, we, the uh, folks that reached out to us for this project needed some results very quickly. Um, they have since, he's the same student uh, this fall, is revisiting the project and is going to be um, doing a little further data analysis, and I'll talk about that um, toward the end of the talk. So we'll call these preliminary results and then some observations that we made um, in those data. So uh, Sea Island, Georgia is um, on the southern coast of Georgia, really close to the Florida line. It's a barrier island, and um, those barrier islands are pretty unique in that they have a pretty high tidal range of about three meters. Uh, so this results in really short um, bar barrier islands that are kind of constantly shifting um, pretty quickly over time, and they have really large tidal inlets. Um, it has a long history, as most of the um, coastal plain of the uh, southeastern U.S. does, of uh, cotton plantations in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, those were replaced in the early 20th century by growing vacation home development and um, high-end resorts. Uh, today, the island is fully built out with very high-end luxury homes in a gated community uh, that contains about 500 um, very large homes and uh, golf courses. So as you can um, maybe see in the top picture, the uh, most of the island uh, is fronted by a very large rock re revetment. Um, except for the very southern tip of the island, which is the only undeveloped portion of the island, and that's the focus of this uh, project. Um, two large groins were constructed about 20, 30 years ago 
um, in order to hold the beach nourishment sand in the central portion of the island where uh, most of the residential um, properties are. The golf course is at the northern end of the island and most of the residences are in that central portion. Um, I thought it was interesting that beach nourishment occurs so frequently in um, this area that um, some of the uh, Google Earth imagery caught it um, on on camera, some of the beach nourishment practices going on, which you can see in that uh, lower photo. In um, 2021, another smaller groin was built um, just south of that southern groin. So there is a groin up near the golf course at the northern end of the island. Uh, then the one you see in the top of the photo here uh, was, was one of those older groins uh, built about 20, 30 years ago. And then um, you can see a portion of the third groin that was put in um, to the south of that southern groin. And this is to hold just um, four new home sites. So that groin, um, along with those existing groins, are trapping sand. This is very evident in, uh, in the air photos that we utilized in the study. And it's causing um, a lot of longshore movement of sand. And you will see very quickly in the imagery that it's um, shrinking over time. So it was... Um, after Irma in, hit in 2017 that they had decided to build that third groin because so much of the island was inundated um, at the time. And they really wanted to um, preserve those, those four new home sites. So uh, the data that were used in this project, so again, the student um, was working uh, independently on this. Uh, they had learned in class how to find um, photos, um, where to get them, how to download them, unzip them, bring them into the software. And so um, we used uh, Earth Explorer as the, um, through the USGS as the image download site and got um, photos back as far as we could go, um, which date back to 1988. Um, those older images, everything before 2009, are um, only three-band photos, whereas the newer ones are uh, four-band photos. We also um, utilize uh, LIDAR data and drone imagery that was collected um, on site in uh, spring, and actually in May of this year, um, to help identify uh, land cover features for the classification process. So after the imagery was obtained, um, everything was loaded into ArcGIS Pro and uh, clipped to just see islands so that uh, we could minimize processing time. Um, the bands were extracted um, from the newer imagery to create co uh, false color composites. And for the purposes of this talk, we're only presenting the um, the results from the the 2009 to um, 2020 21 um, imagery because we're still working with standardizing some of uh, the uh, results from the older imagery to to make it um, play friendly with the newer imagery. Um, that older imagery um, did have to be. Um, combined into a raster mosaic uh, because the tiles were so much smaller. Uh, so that student got some experience doing that as well. So the first um, step that he took was to calculate uh, the normalized difference vegetation index or NDVI. Um, very simply just by going to the imagery tab, selecting indices, um, NDVI, and then which bands to use um, for, um, for the processes. Um, so these, um, these tools are very easy to use in ArcGIS Pro now. It's a pretty simple process. Um, 
sometimes the scale doesn't always output in the right range that it should. Um, and so we're kind of working with the uh, way the imagery is loaded in there to to try to get the scientific output of uh, between negative one and one. Uh, for the older imagery, uh, the VARI was calculated uh, using the, all three bands. After um, NDVI was created, um, he worked, spent most of his time working on um, the classifications for all of those years of imagery. Um, so don't feel like you have to read through all of this, but essentially trees, um, we didn't classify any of the completely dead skeleton trees as trees. Um, in the rework of the this project, we're doing it both ways, classifying those trees as trees and then excluding them from the trees class uh, to see if that uh, changes the results in any uh, substantial way. Uh, we have shrubs and then we have a variety of different grasses. Uh, marsh grasses uh, was of particular interest to us because um, based on observation, it appears that um, marsh grasses are pretty quickly shrinking as the island shrinks. Um, we see dune grasses. Uh, these are located on both the dune areas as well as the overwash um, sand that um, comes in when um, the island floods uh, substantially and brings uh, deposits sand over, over the island in these um, fan type um, features. Uh, so there's regular beach sand, which we only classified up to the high tide line. And then um, open water was the tidal creeks and rivers that kind of cut through uh, the, the southern tip of the island. So his workflow, um, he wanted to get a little more experience in fusion and it was easier to have them side by side to compare um, the LIDAR data to uh, what he was actually doing in the uh, training with the training data for the classifications. So it, this is just a really basic, I like to call kind of quick and dirty classification, just the very simple um, supervised classification where uh, you just assign training samples using the training sample manager to create um, polygons for each class and then let the uh, software do the work for you. So um, again, using the classification wizard um, and selecting the different um, types of classification to be used, in this case, supervised using those training samples. Um, he utilized object-based type um, rather than the pixel-based and um, imported his uh, shape file from the training samples manager step previous. So um, as you can see, just looking at the imagery, this is what the, the all the four band imagery uh, looks like for the, the Sea Island site. Uh, you can see back in 2009, how much area the island encompassed um, versus that of today. Uh, so those, um, we see in the imagery that the first two groins were installed sometime between 1988 and 1993. Um, and then the third groin was installed in 2021. So the, uh, the intent is for this project to continue for the next five years. There's funding to, to do so. Um, this, this case actually went to, um, to court and um, these data were um, the reason they needed to be obtained very quickly uh, was because there was a, a pending court case that they would, wanted to present some of these data in. Um, the, it was the Surfrider Foundation that sued the development company and um, tried to get them to stop the installation of that third groin. Um, they ultimately lost, but they gained um, uh, funding for monitoring the vegetation on the southern end of the island um, over the next um, several years. And so that's 
what we wanted to do is establish kind of some baseline data, see what changes we've seen over time thus far so that we can track that change um, into the future. So uh, this is uh, the output from the NDVI um, results. These are again being, we're kind of redoing everything this fall and trying to uh, standardize things a bit more. Uh, we're working with what we have as far as um, the, the image dates. Uh, most of these, all of these actually, all um, seven of these images are NAEP imagery, which are collected um, every couple years during the growing season. Uh, so they're, they're all growing season, hopefully peak productivity uh, images that can be, can capture um, the vegetation um, in its full growth and therefore result in good NDVI measurements. Um, I know that metric has um, a wealth of issues associated with it that we won't get into today, but um, they are, we're kind of working with um, trying to tighten this process up a little bit. So the values over time were extracted um, by class by year, the mean values. And you can see just looking at the trends of the bar graphs that um, there was some major shift that happened between 2010 and 2013. Um, there was not a major hurricane or anything during that time. Um, we uh, Best we can think is it's some kind of uh, lag from the um, just the slow death of the vegetation from the installation of potentially those older groins um, and some of the processes of uh, the overwash being deposited from storms that aren't necessarily hurricane strength but uh, that you know with that high tidal range that they have of three meters anytime there is some kind of a storm there is a lot of inundation and overwash that happens uh, but you can see um, if you would take note um, there's been some slight increase in the dune grasses and in the trees in most recent years uh, again it's very slight and um, probably not statistically significant although that has not been assessed at this time. Um, these, uh, for the dune grasses, they are planting a lot of grasses on the dunes to try to help with the erosion that's happening. Um, and then with the trees, we're just not really sure what's going on there. So um, in the further analysis that's happening, um, uh, the student's going to be using um, the change detection tools to figure out exactly uh, what geographic locations on the island are changing um, rather than just um, area by class or values by class, that is. So, um, next up were the um, classifications that took him, um, a, again, a bit of time to do and redo, although the uh, workflow is pretty simple in running the supervised, uh, the, just the standard supervised classification. Um, he did take some time to do some uh, post-classification manual cleanup and adjusting the polygons for the classes based on what he was seeing in the LIDAR and the drone imagery try to get those um, classes as accurate as, um, as possible. So um, these results um, show that area in um, square meters over time has reduced um, quite substantially over the years. Um, it's been a gradual change. You can see that in the imagery. Um, you can see that also by class. Um, largely in those uh, in that marsh grass class that is of um, utmost concern. Um, we can take this class out and uh, it kind of shows the trends in the other classes a, a little better, but um, we see an increase in the overwash sand from uh, the deposition from large storm events 
And then we see um, some of the dune grass area coming back um, after a decline. It's kind of doesn't have a, a very uh, strong signal. It's, it's kind of a bimodal signal. Um, shrubs decreased and are slowly um, kind of increasing is what it looks like as well as um, with the trees. And so um, what we hope to see um, is kind of why this is happening. So some of the um, just kind of observations that were made from these data are that um, overall NDVI decreased um, over the study period time, but no, most notably between that 2010 to 2013 mark. Again, we don't have a single event to blame that on, so i um, not really sure what happened there other than just um, changes observed from the installation of those older groins. But um, most notably, the changes were in the tree and shrub class as those are dying away and um, not, not really returning very rapidly. Um, the areas of each class has also decreased since 2009, most notably in that marsh grass class at about 50, 54%. Um, there have been some major hurricanes to hit um, in this study period, uh, Matthew in 2016, Irma in 2017, and Michael in 2018. And they all um, inundated the island, but it's not showing up in the uh, imagery and the analysis that we did as having as big of an impact as the uh, that of between 2010 and 2013. So um, the project was first initiated to look at changes from the installation of that third uh, southernmost groin. And um, however, we believe the changes we're seeing are um, just a long lag time of slow um, death of the vegetation from the um, older groins and then from uh, deposition of sand from the storm events. So we see the dune grasses colonizing those um, overwash areas and likely we might see um, further colonization by shrubs and then eventually trees in these areas if they um, have been stable over time for long enough, but um, mostly these uh, the vegetation is dying back. As you can see from the uh, photo uh, at the top, there's a lot of skeleton trees um, observed in the drone imagery that was, that was taken. Um, the uh, overwash is also indicative of a narrowing island, and we do see it both narrowing and getting shorter at the southern tip. So um, the student who's working on this as a project this fall is um, being paid by the Surfrider Foundation. They're the ones that uh, that funded the project that uh, sued the development company and got the award to monitor vegetation on the southern end of the island. Um, he's going to be working with some of the um, deep learning classification tools that are available in ArcGIS Pro to see if um, uh, kind of a more detailed analysis would result in any uh, changes in the in the data. And again, he will be using uh, change detection tools to uh, try to locate specific locations on the island where changes are are being made um, both in the positive and in the in the negative. Um, so I want to thank Surfrider for funding the project and also Josiah Young for collecting the drone imagery for us this May at our request. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I doubt this would even be feasible, but perhaps there would be more sa sand transport if they took the southern groin out. So has anybody talked about that? 
Yeah, they they tried to prevent that from being installed in the first place, and that was the court battle that they lost. Uh, so they really uh, are insisting on keeping that lower groin in there to maintain sand between those two groins for those four additional home sites, uh, because they are uh, the the lots alone are multi million dollar lots. Yeah, but I agree with you. Yes. Um, have y'all looked at any of the surrounding islands to see that don't have groins installed? I guess kind of like a um, like a baseline to see how they've changed over the years as well. We have only looked at Sea Island. We haven't looked at um, other islands to see how quickly they've been changing. But that is a good future direction that that we could take. All right. Thanks, guys.